Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kayla and it's time to crack into a good book. So it's time for a weekly update and I have seven books to talk to you about today that I finished this last time. Now I was definitely in a spooky mood, so a lot of this is horror, but we do have some urban fantasy and thrillers as well. So before we jump into it, leave a ghost emoji in the comments to let me know that you're here. So we will, like always, move our way from the lowest to the highest rated, and the first book I'll talk about today is a two-star book, and that's Forging a Nightmare by Patricia A. Jackson. So I received this for review from the publisher through NetGalley, and this comes out November 23rd. And this is an adult urban fantasy where a serial killer is going after victims born with 12 fingers and 12 toes, marking them as Nephilim. So we have our FBI agent, Michael, who's called in to investigate, and he essentially discovers a Marine Corps sniper, Anaba, who's listed as killed in action, and Michael has to confront his heritage and work with Anaba or die. So I honestly had much higher hopes for this, but the execution was just so messy, and I'm really bummed that I didn't like this more. I really struggled to get through it, which was honestly rather surprising because there were so many things going on. I just think that the story didn't ultimately end up going where I thought it would. Like, I thought it would be a lot more about the serial killer investigation, and that's really only, like, the first chapter, and that's it. And you, like, get to know who the bad guys are, that reveal is really early on, and then it just kind of goes all over the place after that. I didn't feel like there was a coherent story arc in place, though I did like the ideas in general with, you know, the angels, the serial killer, we have the horsemen of the apocalypse involved, and then I did like how various beings from mythology were involved, and I thought some of this did feel, you know, innovative and fun. However, I felt like there was just far too much happening in the span of one book and that it would have been better to spread these things out over multiple books so that you could really develop them more in detail. This book definitely had a lot of issues with telling rather than showing, like, there are several moments where characters just lecture for info dumps, and it just this was honestly just really boring to read. And, like, knowing the villains really early on also just led to a serious lack of suspense for me. And there are also, like, the bragging, oh ho, you know, let me tell you all my plans in detail type, so I just didn't really like that all that much. And I also just generally didn't like any of the characters, unfortunately. So Michael is like an extra special chosen one. And while I don't mind like the chosen one trope in general, I felt like it was just one reveal after another in a short span of time. And we don't really get the time to kind of decompress and, you know, absorb the details of this and how this affects Michael. And it's just, again, one thing after another that's thrown at us. I think Anaba was okay. She's this Marine, and I did like her abilities as a nightmare and just generally, like, thought that the idea of a nightmare was really cool. She is often abrasive, though, and I don't know. I mean, once she decides that you're okay, she's really protective, so that was something, <laughs> I guess. But I hated the romance that developed, and I have serious issues with it. So I'm going to go into a little bit of spoilers as to why that is, so if you want to skip that, you know, you can you can jump ahead after the spoilers. So basically, Anaba is not really given a choice to be his nightmare, so I think there's some issues with consent with this. But what really just irritated me so much was that her wife literally dies, and then they are immediately kissing afterwards. And I'm like, what in the hell is this? I didn't think they had a connection at all, and I thought this was just really out of place and distasteful. So they also jumped to saying, I love you, basically, immediately after that, which I thought was far too much. So I, again, clearly had major issues with the romance. I think that this was really out of place. And again, I think this would have been better, like, maybe more natural if these things had been spread out over multiple books so we could, like, kind of see a connection between them. But as it is, I don't think it is good at all. Okay, so into spoilers, <laughs> we do have a lot of angels, and I liked that the horsemen, again, make an appearance here. It's a cool way to weave some of these story elements in. And we do have really nice diversity, like our main characters are black, we have a lot of characters of color in general, and I will say the author is good at writing about horses, so that felt really realistic. But generally, the plot is too messy for me, it's like just one thing after another without really going into detail, and some of the story elements didn't really make sense, like it just felt like we had a bit of a random aside at, at one point, and I was like, I don't really know how this ties into the story ultimately. There's a lot of random battles, a lot of tests for things, and it just it just felt 
messy again. <laughs> so they were really good ideas, but I think it kind of just used some restructuring and development to suit my taste. And I realized I've been kind of criticizing this book a lot and like I do have problems with it, but I think the ideas were cool and I do see a lot of really positive reviews on Goodreads. So I would encourage you to check those out. But unfortunately for me, I would not personally recommend this book. And then we have a three star book and that's The Hidden by Melanie Golding. So I received this for review from the publisher through NetGalley and this comes out November 9th. So this is an adult thriller where a little girl is found abandoned and when her mother arrives, the authorities release them thinking, you know, it's just a t toddler running off. Then a single man is found bludgeoned and left for dead, but the kids' toys in his apartment raise more questions than answers. And then every night we have Ruby who stares into this man's apartment and discovers his secret family, his unusually silent daughter and his mentally unstable wife who claims to be a selkie. So this wife begs Ruby to help her find the seal skin that this man is hidden. So this was enjoyable, but I don't think it was quite as good as her previous book, Little Darlings. I did struggle to get through it in places, and I think this may have been in part due to the fact that there's a, link, a little bit less tension in this book compared to the previous one, where you're trying to decide if, you know, the main character is crazy or telling the truth. And I do think there is some of that aspect here with like, are these supernatural type elements real or not? Here, we're trying to obviously figure out if Constance is actually a selkie, but I think there's a little bit less ambiguity in this particular book with this aspect, uh, as opposed to the previous book, Little Darlings, with these like folklore elements. So there are several mysteries here. You know, we're trying to figure out what happened to Constance, why she left her baby, where's Ruby, and what happened to this man who's injured. So I think more things come up along the way, and I found some of these to be rather compelling, but I don't think some of them were explored in as much detail as I necessarily would have wanted. I really liked getting to explore Selkies as a topic though, but again, it's kind of one of those things where I'm not quite sure what I would have preferred in terms of them, you know, being real or not. We do have multiple timelines and point of view sections here, and I did get confused a few times with the timelines, but I think it mostly worked all right for telling the story. The characters were decent overall. Ruby certainly has a complicated family history, and I did feel bad for her because some of this is some rough stuff to deal with, but I really enjoyed getting to see her realizations of the book, which I think come up in part at least because of her involvement with Constance and the baby Leonie. So I liked how she tries to help them out and how she puts herself in danger to save Leonie. Then we have Joanna, who's a police officer who's related to Ruby. She's all right overall. I think her perspective really allows us to see the links that people will go to in order to protect their family. And so that's kind of nice. Constance is complicated. <laughs> Obviously, she's it's like, does she have mental health issues or is she telling the truth about being a selkie? I felt really bad for her because things didn't go as planned for her and she ends up trapped in a bad situation. But ultimately, I think this was an enjoyable book. I really like the folklore aspects, especially with the selkie involvement. I don't think it was quite as good as Little Darlings, but I would still recommend this if it sounds interesting to you. So then we'll move to a three and a half star book, and that's Nina and the Undead by Amy McCaw. So we're getting into like all of the YA horror now. So this is a YA horror book set in New Orleans in 1995. We have Mina who arrives from England to visit her sister and she ends up getting a job at a horror movie mansion. She meets Jared, one of Libby's housemates, and he's a fellow horror enthusiast. When working in the mansion, Mina discovers a body with puncture wounds on her neck and this body is clutching a lock of hair that looks suspiciously like Libby's. So this was really enjoyable overall. I loved the atmosphere and setting, especially you know with it being set in New Orleans. I thought that was super fun. It has almost this like fun pulpy vibe to it, which was just really enjoyable to read. I liked the references that we get to, you know, like Interview with a Vampire and The Lost Boys and other horror movies and books of that time period. I also liked the elements of folklore and legends of New Orleans that we get. And, you know, we have these sort of mysterious killings that seem to be replicating those from the past. And I thought that was super fun to have that, you know, sort of connection tie everything in together with the plot. I enjoyed the mystery of what was going on and of course vampires. <laughs> so I think there were some interesting developments in this book that I didn't necessarily expect. In terms of the characters, you know, we have Mina who goes to New Orleans to try to reconnect with her sister Libby. I felt bad for her because she's kind of alone and has been isolated from her family because of various reasons for each family member. I enjoyed her investigation into what's happening 
I think she she's obviously very into horror movies and books and I just loved how she likes reading. While I'm not super into horror movies themselves, I thought she was a really fun main character. I also really liked the chemistry between her and one of the other characters. Libby, her sister, is much more aloof and demanding, but I feel like I understand her at least, you know, mildly better now after the, after the book. And I just really look forward to them hopefully repairing their relationship. Jared, Libby's housemate, is rather sweet, and I loved how he bonds with Mina over their shared interests and how he helps with the investigation. We do have several other interesting side characters as well, and just generally I had a fun time with this, and I'm really excited that, uh, you know, a sequel was just announced for this book because I definitely want to return to our characters and the setting to explore more fun, you know, hopefully vampires, but I would certainly be open to other supernatural type creatures. So I obviously had a really good time with this and would certainly recommend it, especially if you're in the mood for some sort of a vampire book. Now we'll get into some four star books and the first one I'll talk about is The Girl from the Well by Ren Chapeco. So this is a YA horror book following a dead girl who hunts child killers to release the innocent ghosts from their tethers after once being a victim herself. She meets Tark who's a boy with mysterious tattoos and wants to help him. <laughs> so this was super dark and spooky. This was perhaps the scariest YA book I've ever read at least with some of the scenes. Like, basically it kept reminding me of scenes from The Ring, which is just one of the most terrifying movies I've ever seen. And like, I think I mentioned it a few weeks back, maybe when, perhaps when talking about this book, I don't know. But I watched it in like seventh grade and had just horrible nightmares at, after like, I was, I was at a sleepover too and like called my parents in the middle of the night to be like, come get me. And they're like, nope. So anyway. <laughs> I, I still can like vividly picture those scenes even though it has obviously been like several years since I've been in seventh grade so anyway it definitely has a lot of disturbing imagery in this book and it was uh, it was just super creepy to read but I liked it so we do have some scenes inspired by real life murder and this is pretty brutal even more so now that I know that this was real, so I actually did a buddy read of this with Amber from Books of Amber, as well as Justine from I Should Read That, and they were the ones who were like, oh yeah, this is based on some, you know, real life murder. I was like, what? So I had to investigate that, obviously, but yeah, so even, or, so now knowing that, it makes some of the scenes a bit more horrifying, certainly. So I really liked the bits of serial killers that we get here, as well as the Japanese folklore and mythology surrounding this particular story of Okiku. <laughs> this was obviously like super fast paced and I just blew through it. I really appreciated that our main character Okiku is sort of this morally gray character and does actually help people. So this is a nice take on things, especially because it could have just taken the same you know route as the ring with her just murdering everybody. <laughs> so she does have a code that she tries to follow to rescue or avenge kids. It's also like an interesting narration style that she has where she initially refers to people just by their description and then gradually starts to refer to them by their name as she gets more connected with them. And I think that was a nice like stylistic choice to show how she's drawn into their lives and actually does care about them. And I, I thought this was really fun. I liked how she can obviously be this avenging ghost, but she can also just be a girl. Tark, our boy with mysterious tattoos, has obviously had some strange and terrible things happen to him. And again, with these tattoos, I really liked learning about the origins and the meaning behind these. And just generally, I liked the overall direction that the story went with it. Tark is a bit of a loner, but he kind of has to be because of his background. And I really liked the bond that we get that's developing between him and Okiku. We also have his cousin, and I really liked how she tries to make sure that Tark is okay, and she goes to some serious lengths to ensure this. I thought she was kind of overall, and I enjoyed her, you know, the inclusion of her character. So I definitely enjoyed this book and want to continue. It's a duology. I've actually ordered the sequel, and it should be here today. So perhaps I'll be reading that this week. But if you're looking for a very creepy, but also, like, kind of satisfying, <laughs> I guess, YA horror book, I would definitely recommend picking this up. The next four star book I'll talk about is Burden Falls by Kat Ellis, again YA horror. So this is set in a town that's rumored to be haunted by dead-eyed Sadie. Ava, our main character, has had nightmares where Sadie comes calling after the horrific accident that killed her parents a year ago. Someone close to her is murdered and she becomes the prime suspect, so Ava starts to wonder if Sadie actually might be real. I thought this was really enjoyable overall and I did actually like this more than Harrow Lake, which was the 
you know, previous book I've read by this author. Both are good YA horror, but I think this is the one that I enjoyed more. I think there are some nice moments here of like, are there supernatural things happening or not? And I like the overall direction that this went. I think there's an interesting and gruesome mystery of what's happening to some of the people in this town. And I really liked the folklore of Sadie here. I also enjoyed, there's actually like a slight reference to Harrow Lake here, so that was a fun little tidbit to pick up on. But I liked the small town vibe that we get here. We have this long time family feud between the Millers and the Thorns, and there's like these weird eyes drawn all over town. I think it was fun to learn more about this, as well as the general history of the town and these families. There are certainly a lot of secrets to uncover here. We do have some dark themes with deaths and trauma. I think the pacing was pretty good in general. I found it to be gripping and just wanted to keep reading. Eva was great to follow. I think I felt pretty sympathetic towards her because she's lost her parents and has had a hard time moving past it, understandably. I liked how she's really into art. Like specifically, she's working on a graphic novel, so I thought that was a really fun touch. She has to navigate some pretty complex relationships with people that she thinks that she can trust. And it's interesting to see how some people she initially doesn't like and doesn't trust may actually be better than she thinks. So I think with Ava, this book deals a lot with grief and processing complex feelings after death in a very nice way. So, so in terms of some of the other characters, we have Dominic. And I was initially not sure what to make of him, but I ended up really liking him, especially with how he interacts with Ava. I enjoyed how he, his sister Freya, and some of their friends have this paranormal mystery type like podcast or channel. And I think it was a, a, ch a channel. I think they were filming things. <laughs> but anyway, we do have some other characters that are a little bit harder to judge with their motives, and I really enjoyed learning more about them. So I had a really fun time with this overall. If you're looking for this like small town, creepy, is this supernatural or not type vibe, I would definitely recommend picking this up. So the last of the four star books I'll talk about today is The Girls Are Never Gone by Sarah Glenn Marsh. So this is again YA horror and we follow Dare who's a supernatural skeptic and she hosts a paranormal investigation podcast. She goes to this Arrington estate to investigate the death of a teenager 30 years ago who's rumored to haunt the estate still. So Arrington is full of surprises, good ones including the cute daughter of the house's new owner and as well as strange ones like these mysterious messages, ghostly appearances, and an unnatural current in the lake. So this is an interesting and fun idea. It apparently is somewhat based on the author's own family house and so I thought that was like a really cool touch. But I really liked the spooky atmosphere and this paranormal investigation and podcast that we've got going on here. The house is pretty creepy, certainly. There are lots of spooky things happening, and we have this ominous lake. I think some of the scenes are rather, like, gross and disturbing, but I also, like, really enjoyed them. So, yeah, I, I really liked seeing Dare try to decide if there's a rational explanation for things or if it's truly something supernatural here. I think the pacing was good in general, though I think I did struggle a little bit in the middle right before things start to really escalate. I also really liked the ending. It definitely fits in with the overall vibe of the book, I think, and it's an interesting choice that I certainly appreciate. I really liked all the girls and their dynamic. Dare, our main character, is great, so we do actually get representation for type 1 diabetes with her, and it's really nice to be able to see what this representation, her just like living her life, and you know, she also has to check in to make sure she's healthy. I think she's clever, stubborn, curious, and kind, and she's also very de dedicated to her friends. I loved the bonds between her, Holly, and Quinn. I think they all were super supportive of each other and are there for each other, especially when things start to get really creepy. <laughs> so I also like seeing Holly and Quinn accept her for who she is like very easily because Dare is a little bit concerned about people judging her about her diabetes, and I think this was, again, just really positive representation. We of course have Waffles, who is Dare's dog, and he's supposed to be her medical alert dog, but he's not always the best at his job, but I thought Waffles was just really cute, and I loved him as a companion. Quinn is an artist, and she seems really sweet. She is Puerto Rican on her dad's side, so we do have some representation for that. I think she's much more willing to believe in the supernatural than Dare, and it's really fun to see how they approach things differently and how they have conversations about these things. I really liked them together. I felt the chemistry, but I also liked how it didn't feel insta-lovey. So we, then we have Holly, our other member in this group, and she's trying to get out of this small town. I felt bad for her because she just wants something more, but she's been held back so far. 
We do get to see her the least out of all of the girls in the group, I think, but I still really liked the general group dynamic, and I think the inclusion of her character was really nice. Of course, we do have some adults in charge here. We have Rose and Carly, who are in charge of this restoration of the house. I'm a little bit mixed on them. Like, Rose is rather aloof, while Carly does seem a little bit more approachable. But, you know, they do kind of interfere with Dare's investigation, though. So we do have some representation as well for LGBTQ plus characters, and I thought all of this representation was really nicely done. So... Again, if you're looking for a spooky <laughs> YA horror book, I would definitely recommend this. I think there were some really cool aspects here, especially with, you know, some of the, uh, the more supernatural things. So if you are looking for that type of vibe, I would definitely recommend picking this up. So the last book I'll talk about today is a five-star book, and that's Rules for Vanishing by Kate Ellis Marshall. So again, YA horror, <laughs> where once a year, a path appears in a forest and Lucy Gallows beckons. A year ago, Sarah's sister disappeared, and Sarah has grown distant from her friends. A mysterious text invites them to play the game and uh, find Lucy, so Sarah is determined to do this in order to find Becca as well. So I really enjoyed this, obviously. I read it super quickly, in part because there are some mixed media elements here, which I just absolutely loved. I love that in general, but I thought this was a really fun way to tell the story. There are some elements here that I really didn't anticipate, especially with the direction it went, and I really love them. Now, I don't want to, like, specifically mention them because I don't want to spoil things, but it has somewhat of, like, a, a folklore take on things, which I, it's, like, something that I find really interesting, and so I think that helps me enjoy it more, and I just, I just loved it, obviously. <laughs> so we do have some creepy moments and spooky imagery in general. There are several times where I was like, nope! I thought some of these elements were creative, and again, this kind of ties in with, like, the direction it, it went. There were some moments here that I actually did have to reread because I was like, wait, what just happened? And I think this was pretty cleverly done. There are reasons for why some of these things happened that seem a little bit odd or confusing at first, and I thought this was just super fun to read. <laughs> I, again, loved the folklore elements that we get here with the legend of Lucy, who is this ghost girl. I really enjoyed the journey that our characters go through and think it had a few surprises, though I did certainly have some suspicions about some things. I liked Sarah, our main character in general. She's a bit of an unreliable narrator, but I liked how she's motivated to find her sister after she vanished a year ago. She's also kind of pushed people away or had people abandon her after Becca's disappearance, and I felt really bad for her about this, obviously, but I liked her determination and conviction that Becca didn't just vanish or, you know, run away and that she could, in fact, be found. She's joined by her friends, or former friends, I guess. So this is an interesting group of people. I guess I'll specifically mention Anthony, who's kind of like her former best friend. I liked how she tr he tried to help her, and generally, I think... Some of our characters have some heroic moments, but there are certainly some really ill-advised ones as well. I don't want to go into a lot of detail because of spoilers, but I really liked the dynamics and mysteries of our characters. So we do have some great representation here with characters with stutters, there's a character who wears hearing aids, we have characters of color, and there's some LGBTQ plus characters as well. So obviously I had a really fun time with this and like the universe that it's setting up, it seems like we're going to explore a couple of the things mentioned here in the in Our Last Echoes, which is a book that came out earlier this year that I actually just bought. <laughs> so I can't wait to explore more of these paranormal writ mysteries and events and like really hope that this just becomes like an entire universe <laughs> that we get to explore. So if you're looking for a very fast paced YA horror book that has folklore elements, and, you know, there's more things going on than just this spooky ghost girl, I would highly suggest picking this one up. So with that, those are all the books that I have to talk to you about today. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books or think you might pick them up. And for your question of the day, have you been re reading some spooky books this week as we go into Halloween? So I do have a Discord channel, and if you want to join that, the link's in the description below. I hope you're all having an excellent day and are reading something awesome. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a big thumbs up, as that would certainly help me out. But with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up here and see you in the next one.